This program is going to look at some of the trends in oxidation and reduction. I want to begin with the halogens over on the right hand side of the periodic table, group number 17. I have them presented here. One thing you'll notice about our halogens is this particular number here. This refers to the electronegativity of our elements. And we can see here a pattern that fluorine has a tremendous tendency to gain electrons versus iodine further down in the periodic table with less of a tendency to gain electrons. Generally speaking, non-metals tend to gain electrons. By gaining electrons, they're reduced. And the act of reduction involves taking the electrons from somebody else. Hence, they are also good oxidizing agents. That leads to the meme I posted down here at the bottom. The oxidizing agent is reduced. And likewise, we'll see later on, the reducing agent itself is oxidized. So as I mentioned, of this particular family, fluorine has the greatest tendency to gain electrons. That makes fluorine the strongest oxidizing agent. I'm going to use the short form SOA to represent strongest oxidizing agent. Further down the table, as we move to iodine, it's least likely to gain electrons. As a result, it's the weakest of the oxidizing agents. So we can see here a general pattern. As we move up the periodic table, we move from a weak oxidizing agent to a strong oxidizing agent. Let's take a look at how this can be employed in predicting the products and whether or not a reaction can occur. Here I have aqueous chlorine, so here's the Cl2, a chlorine bonded to a chlorine, sharing an electron, and potassium iodide, an ionic solid dissolved in the water. So there would be potassium ions and iodide ions. So iodide has gained potassium's electron, and as a result has become negative. Let's focus for a moment on these two nonmetals and their location over here. Chlorine, I can see, is the stronger oxidizing agent. It has the greatest tendency to gain electrons versus iodine. So since chlorine doesn't have the electron and iodine does, this electron is going to tend to make its way over to chlorine. As a result, chlorine will then develop a negative charge and the iodine will then share its electron with another iodine and form I2 solid. Also present in this mix is the potassium ion, which we call a spectator ion. So we can see here a reaction that took place. We could also summarize it this way, saying that we form potassium iodide, aqueous, and I2. And I guess to balance this, we'd need a 2 here and a 2 here. So again, because chlorine doesn't have the electron and it's a stronger oxidizing agent, it tends to want to gain one. And that's our general rule. The stronger oxidizing agent will tend to gain an electron. Let's now look at reversing the scenario. And what I mean by that is we have iodine bonded to iodine, sharing an electron. And we have potassium chloride down below. Again, we identify our two nonmetals. And chlorine is the stronger oxidizing agent, meaning it wants to gain the electron. Well, if you look here, it's already gained the electron. So this is unlikely to react.
Let's move over to the other side of the periodic table now, where the metals reside. Here I've presented a small list of metals in what we call an activity series. This is not something you're going to have to be memorized. You would probably be given it. And we have in an activity series the most reactive metal up top and the least reactive towards the bottom. Now, what do metals tend to do? In order for metals to become stable, they tend to lose electrons. The act of losing electrons means they like to be oxidized. And since they like to be oxidized, they are therefore giving their electrons to somebody else and hence act as reducing agents. In a similar fashion, as we move up the table, our more reactive species is most likely to lose electrons. If it's most likely to lose electrons, that makes it a strong reducing agent. which I'll use SRA to represent. Copper, on the other hand, at the bottom of the table, is least likely to lose electrons, is a weak reducing agent. So we have a similar pattern, except a strong reducing agent is up here and our weak reducing agent at the bottom. So in these particular reactions, we focus on the metallic part of the species. So we have zinc and copper. From my table, let's locate them. Zinc is higher up. Zinc is a stronger reducing agent and therefore the stronger reducing agent is most likely to lose its electrons. So here's my strip of zinc. These are in a metallic bond with each other, sharing electrons. And outside here we have our copper um, 2 plus and our sulfate at 2 minus. From the charge that I see that resides on the copper, I can see that copper has lost the electrons, not the zinc. Zinc wants to lose its electrons and give those to the copper. And as a result, when it loses electrons, it will become a positively charged ion and therefore attract the sulfate to it. So that'll form zinc sulfate aqueous and now the copper, which has gained the electrons, would then form metallic copper. And to balance this one, I believe we're already balanced. So that's what we would see happening in this particular scenario. Let's reverse it again. So this time I have copper. Here would be my zinc with its two plus and the sulfate with its two minus. Again, let's identify our two metallic substances. Zinc is the stronger reducing agent. It wants to lose electrons. Well, it already has. If it has a two plus charge, it's already lost electrons. So in this scenario, we are going to see no reaction. Let's employ this idea in a question. In this question, we're dealing with three unknown metallic substances. And we're told in some scenarios and combinations they react and others they don't. So let's begin with number one. X and Y are my metallic substances. I can see here that there was a reaction. And I know that a reaction occurs if a stronger reducing agent gives away its electrons. So the electrons are going to be given to substance Y. 
So if I make a brief table here with my strongest reducing agent at the top and my weakest reducing agent at the bottom, I know that X must lie somewhere above Y because it must be the stronger reducing agent here in order to see this reaction. In the second scenario, again, I identify metallic substances, there was no reaction. That would indicate to me that zinc, or sorry, Z here, is the stronger reducing agent. It's already lost its electrons and therefore doesn't need to react. So Z must lie above Y, which would put it either in this location or in this location. Let's go to the last reaction. Z reacts with X. That makes Z a stronger reducing agent. It must lie above X. So that's going to put Z up top. So if I'm going to list my metals now from the strongest to the weakest, I would go Z is stronger than X, is stronger than Y. So that's it. Don't forget that reducing agents like to be oxidized, and oxidizing agents like to be reduced. Thanks for watching.